We're recording. Uh, thank you and good evening. Uh, welcome to the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries Public Hearing on proposals to amend fixed fishing gear rules to further protect endangered species. I'm the agency director, Dan McKiernan. I regret that we're not in a large room meeting face to face, uh, but due to this pandemic, um, we've had uh, a, a number of meetings in this fashion. So I am confident that we can use this virtual meeting technology to provide uh, the information in a meaningful way to you so to allow you to understand the proposals and provide comment back to us, whether it be uh, on the record tonight or in writing. So how about today's virtual meeting? Uh, as Jared just mentioned, it will be recorded and it's gonna be posted on our YouTube channel. There will be a second version of this meeting uh, held tomorrow, uh, same time at six o'clock, that would be December 9th. Uh, we've had some success uh, with these kinds of meetings uh, with Zoom and with Jared as moderator, uh, running the meetings of our Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission. Uh, Jared will be the moderator of the meeting and will be assisting me with recognizing you when you want to speak. Uh, if you know anyone who's unable to use these technologies sufficiently, please have them reach out to us so we can get them the relevant information. Please go to the next slide. This slide describes the legal authorities for DMF to propose and take these actions in relevant timelines. The comment period will remain open through next Friday, December 18th. Uh, we anticipate making a final recommendation uh, to the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission at the scheduled January 7th meeting with some aspects of the proposed rules uh, possibly being implemented for this winter 2021, while some are proposed for 2022. The Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission is a governor's appointed nine member citizens board that oversees most of DMF's regulations and advises the agency on matters concerning marine fisheries management. Proposed amendments require majority approval of the commission. So under the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 30A and pursuant to the authorities found at uh, Mass General Law 130, Sections 2, 17, 10, 17A, 8104, DMF is taking public comment and holding these hearings on proposed amendments to regulations at 322 CMR Chapters 6, 7, and 12. These draft regulations are designed to reduce the risk of endangered right whales becoming entangled in fixed fishing gear and reduce the potential harm posed by fixed fishing gear if a right whale interacts with it. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the comment period will remain open uh, through next Friday. Next slide, please. Regarding this virtual uh, reality that we are in, the virtual rules of engagement, the purpose of the hearing is to afford interested parties to submit data, opinions, comments, or arguments on specific amendments being proposed, or to offer how the proposed amendment can be changed to minimize the impact on those affected while still achieving goals. At the conclusion of this presentation, uh, we will first accept clarifying questions regarding the proposals, and then once all the questions are addressed, we will invite the public comment. I recommend you submit comments in writing. All correspondence will be shared in full with the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission in advance of their January 7th business meeting. The hearing will be recorded and questions and comments are part of the record. All members of the public will be muted through this meeting. To participate in the question and comment period at the end of the meeting, the public is required to use the raise hand function. This will create a queue for questions and comments. DMF will recognize individuals when it is their turn to speak and then we they will be unmuted for the duration of their question or comment. We ask commenters to limit their comments to uh, two minutes per person per hearing item uh, and follow-up comments uh, may be allowed after all persons have had an opportunity to speak. Next slide, please. The written chat function will be enabled and DMF will be answering questions through this function. The chat function will become part of the public record of the hearing. Uh, we ask participants to conduct themselves in a professional and courteous manner. Uh, individuals may be permanently muted or removed from the meeting based on their conduct. It's not necessary for you to comment during this virtual hearing to register your concerns. Uh, feel free to use this virtual hearing for informational purposes and then submit uh, well thought out uh, written comments later. And at the conclusion of the hearing, uh, this video uh, will be posted to the YouTube channel. Dan, just so folks know, because I have had a couple questions in the chat, it is likely that tonight's hearing will be posted on our YouTube channel first thing tomorrow morning. 
and Wednesdays first thing Thursday morning. Thanks, Jared. All right, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide was borrowed and modified from one that the National Marine Fisheries Service presented last week at the New England Fisheries Management Council meeting. Um, uh, you can see that much of the population growth of the last decade has been wiped out by elevated mortalities and reduced calves born each year. Uh, the right whale population, population estimate is approximately 366 animals at the beginning of last year. Uh, right whales uh, have been in decline uh, since 2010, and this coincides with oceanographic regime shift resulting in reduced calves and changing right whale distribution, such as uh, movement up to the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada. Uh, an unusual mortality event uh, since 2017 has occurred, and there have been 32 mortalities and 14 additional serious injuries likely resulting in death, and that's between the two nations of, uh, of Canada and the United States. Uh, entanglement and vessel strike continues to be a significant source of serious injury and mortality throughout the species range. Uh, where whales are being entangled always generates much debate and controversy because it's unusual to retrieve the entangling gear off the whale to successfully identify the gear back to the region, the fishery, or the person. Uh, but clearly two trends have emerged, and that is whales bear many scars that suggest entanglements continue to occur despite uh, regulation changes. And in recent years, most of the entangling gears uh, that have been found on, on uh, injured and dying whales uh, have been in heavy rope, well in excess of the diameter of a half inch, that is, and, and those uh, very thick ropes um, are not being fished by the inshore fleets. Tonight's proposals attempt to address these issues by reducing the risk of entanglement, reducing the severity of, uh, of the injury, and help reveal and, and possibly exonerate the mass state waters fishery through direct or indirect evidence about the source of the rope. Next slide, please. The proposal background, uh, we're responding to two challenges. Uh, the take reduction team initiative, the take reduction team goes back to 1996. And I, I served on that team uh, when it was first formed. And today, Bob, Bob Glenn uh, uh, occupies a seat for uh, the Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, but it has been working since 1996 to um, uh, reduce uh, the takes serious injuries and mortalities of uh, large whales, specifically endangered whales like northern right whales. And the team was brought together uh, to deal with the, the unusual mortality event, and they were last convened in the spring of 2019. State-specific proposals uh, were submitted to NIMS earlier this year. Uh, and NIMS is expected to publish proposed regulations uh, imminently. Uh, at the same time, uh, my agency and the Commonwealth is dealing with litigation. In April 2020, um, there was a citizen suit provision, uh, I'm sorry, a citizen suit uh, that against uh, DMF uh, and its permitting scheme, as well as Secretary of Environmental Affairs. Um, uh, dealing with this uh, issue of uh, unauthorized takes. And so um, we are proposing uh, to meet the court's order. Uh, the court ordered us in April, 2020. We are proposing to, um, to the National Marine Fisheries Service, we are applying for an incidental take permit. And we're gonna talk about that um, in a later slide. But uh, those are the two issues, uh, that are the two kind of forces at play here. One is the ongoing take reduction teams uh, initiative uh, to address uh, long-term uh, decline in right whales. And this has been over two years. And then more recently, uh, the judge's order for us to apply for an incidental take permit. This, these proposals only seek to minimize harm to right whales. The incidental take permit that we're going to be pursuing uh, will likely also address the takes of leatherback turtles, but leatherback turtle uh, related rules uh, are not captured uh, necessarily in this propo these proposals, but will through future rulemaking. As we deal with the uh, National Marine Fishery Service in this application, we're going to be uh, devising those those plans. So next slide, please.
The next three slides cover the proposals. In summary, three fixed gear proposal amendments are proposed. We propose to extend the February 1st through April 30th uh, large well seasonal trap gear closure, which is currently north and east of Cape Cod, to include all waters under the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth for that same time period. This would include adjusting the conch pot haul out period, which at this time extends uh, through April 14th, but that would have to be moved up to April 30th as well. Uh, the second is closing a, a gill net area uh, that has been left open um, since the early days of our conservation plan back in the 90s. Uh, and I'll be showing a map on that. And that's in an area off of Situate. And then uh, the third part of the fixed gear proposals is to implement a closed season for buoyed recreational lobster and crab trap gear. Uh, the closed season is proposed to run from the Tuesday following Columbus Day through the Friday uh, preceding Memorial Day. I, one comment uh, we've been getting about ropeless fishing. We've had a number of written comments regarding ropeless fishing and recognized that there is a lot of interest in moving the lobster fishery uh, to this uh, technology. Um, and uh, specifically, uh, NIMFS, NOAA, fisheries, the NGOs and researchers are looking into the functionality of that tool, the cost of the implementation, how to manage specific user conflicts, particularly among trap fishermen and between mobile and fixed gear fishermen when gear cannot be identified at the surface and enforcement of the trap and trawl features when gear cannot be readily hauled at the surface. While not part of this public hearing, DMF has existing regulatory authority to allow the setting of experimental ropeless fishing gear to investigate these critical questions. So tonight's hearing um, won't deal with that, but just to sum up, um, we have been um, in conversations and we have issued some experimental permits in past seasons to continue to experiment with some of these gears. And in fact, we have received a, a, a pretty substantial grant uh, through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to um, examine the feasibility of ropeless fishing and to help ex uh, to sort of reveal what the hurdles would be to allow um, or, and have the fishery go to, to, to a ropeless, a ropeless uh, you know, full scale fishery. And so um, it's, it's an obviously it's an ongoing issue, but I just wanted to make that clear for anybody who uh, might be listening in and um, is, is seeking for us to move in that direction through these hearings. As far, next slide, please. Uh, slide number eight. Uh, as far as the summary of gear modification proposals, we are proposing to require uh, vertical buoy lines break when exposed to 1,700 pounds of tension. Um, this may be accommodated by fishing buoy lines with 1,700 pound breaking strength or by rigging the buoy line uh, with a contrivance or multiple contrivances, they'll allow it to break at that pressure. Uh, we are also um, requiring all vertical buoy lines affixed to commercial trap gear have a diameter not greater than 3 8 inches, and all vertical buoy lines affixed to recreational lobster uh, and crab trap gear have a diameter not greater than 5 16 That would be slightly smaller. And then effective uh, a year from January, um, prohibit the fishing of single lobster traps on board vessels with an overall length of 29 feet or greater. Uh, these vessels would be required to configure their traps as multiple pot trawls. Uh, vessels with an overall length of less than 29 feet uh, may continue to fish single lobster traps where authorized. Next slide, please. And then the, uh, the, the final slide on other proposals, we have uh, a cap, a proposed cap on the number of student lobster permits uh, issued at 150. Um, and then the next three uh, numbers, two, three, four, and five are more or less uh, housekeeping or technical corrections. We're rewriting the, the, the purpose of the, of the uh, regulations section. Uh, so it better reflects current approach to managing protected species. We're consolidating regulations that govern vessel interactions with right whales into one section. We want to establish a consolidated section of maps relevant to protected species regulations. And we're going to consolidate and refine all regulatory language as necessary to improve clarity and readability of existing regulations. 
Uh, as far as capping the number of student permits goes at 150, this would approximate the current level of fishing by student lobster permit holders and prevent any significant growth in this activity. For example, in 2020, we issued 105 permits. Uh, Note that student lobster permit holders are allowed to fish up to 25 traps and are subject to a season of June 15th to September 15th. And all the gear has to be removed from the water after September 15th. Next slide, please. Getting back to the, uh, to the issue of the incidental take permit that we are pursuing with the National Marine Fishery Service. Uh, the, uh, in January, the, the ESA Endangered Species Act suit was filed. The court did come out with an April decision. Uh, we have begun the incidental take permit application. Uh, this includes uh, extensive um, discussions and, and uh, data queries and examinations of our fisheries with the National Marine Fishery Service. And it's a, uh, it is a fairly complicated process. Uh, one of the key features is to develop what's called a habitat conservation plan. Uh, any ITP, any incidental take permit that is issued for any, any uh, state agency uh, must demonstrate uh, steps that, the, that we would be taking to minimize and mitigate uh, impacts that the activity is having on endangered species. So as I mentioned before, this, this uh, particular uh, set of rules tonight only deals with right whales and uh, not, we aren't dealing with the leatherback issue tonight. Next slide, please. The, the commercial trap closure extension, uh, this is a, a pretty effective map to describe uh, what we're proposing. The pink area in, uh, in and around that that's sort of uh, surrounds Cape Cod. That is the existing three month closure uh, known uh, to many uh, as the Mass Bay restricted area. It is a federal closure. That particular area uh, goes extensively into the federal zone well beyond the state border, but we're just depicting it there for, for uh, completeness. And we're proposing um, adding the other area in, in deep red um, to the existing uh, three month closure, which accounts for all of the territorial waters, uh, or waters under the jurisdiction rather, of uh, Massachusetts. It is, while it is true that the most likely location uh, to see right whales is the, is the current closure around Cape Cod, uh, we have seen right whales in Mass Bay and east of Boston and off Cape Ann in some years, especially in April when right whales are leaving the bay. Uh, the densest aggregations are always in Cape Cod Bay, but when the aggregations disperse, whales can be seen elsewhere in adjacent waters as they move to points north and east uh, in the spring months. So again, the, the rationale uh, of this is to uh, reduce the potential of, of any entanglement uh, in in waters uh, under the jurisdiction uh, of the Commonwealth. <clears throat> Over the past five years, some whales have lingered into early May and DMF has kept Cape Cod Bay closed. Uh, and this will still be the plan. Uh, we're not proposing any changes to that approach or to that regulatory authority. The next slide, please, number 12. The proposed uh, closure is depicted in deep red that is adjacent to the, the pink area. And that is the area off of uh, what appears to be Plymouth uh, through um, about uh, Situate, uh, the Southern part of Situate. Um, this area, uh, has remained open uh, since the DMF conservation program was enacted in 1997. It was last year that we learned that, um, that there was gill net gear uh, being uh, fished in the area. It was an oversight on our part that that area remained open. Um, it, once upon a time, the critical habitat was only uh, uh, in Cape Cod Bay and it was um, basically the western border of the critical habitat was that 70, uh, 30 line that, that goes from the canal north. Um, and so you can see that uh, that area uh, is, was remained open. And so it is our 
uh, intent to propose that during the February through uh, April period that, that area uh, include uh, gill nets as part of the uh, fixed gear closure as well. Uh, we've also learned since the rules were enacted back in the 90s that in some years, uh, right whales uh, can be seen on that western side of the bay, uh, which uh, historically was not part of the original critical habitat, but surveillance over the last 24 years has demonstrated that in some years you can find them over there in significant numbers. Next slide, please, number 13. Uh, the proposed recreational lobster crap trap close season, uh, this would create a close season to buoy trap fishing. It would not affect uh, permit holders who want to use scuba, nor would it affect the setting of traps in the Cape Cod Canal where already uh, vertical buoy lines are prohibited. Most fishermen who fish in the canal uh, uh, use uh, some kind of uh, weighted wire and or, or and, and tie the the traps off to the rock. So there's no there's no potential entanglement there. Um, recreational trap fishing is already included in the existing Cape Cod uh, area seasonal closure. Uh, so it it would um, but this would apply uh, statewide. Uh, we have chosen the day after Columbus Day uh, to the Friday prior to Memorial Day. Uh, we've, it's, we don't have excellent statistics on how much fishing goes on uh, during the winter. We have surveyed the uh, recreational permit uh, holders about five years ago. We, we've written a technical paper based on the results. We got excellent uh, feedback and excellent um, response to the survey. Uh, but, uh, you know, folks have pointed out to us that it's often uh, seen that you can find abandoned recreational gear uh, or you see gear in the water at a time when the, the marinas and the mooring areas are completely uh, devoid of boats. Um, and so um, we, we do know that it's, it's fairly common for recreational lobster men to occasionally lose uh, traps. It's probably a higher gear loss uh, than, um, than most of the commercial fishermen. Despite issuing over 6,400 permits in 2020 and a 10 trap allowance, uh, the overall contribution to traps fished is lower than might appear. Uh, recreational trap fishing accounts for only about 5% of all lobster traps in state waters. The average number of reported traps fished is around seven per permit, not 10, which is the, the maximum allowed. And many permits uh, actually don't fish traps at all, they fish with scuba. And also many permit holders uh, report they did not fish. So um, nevertheless, there is evidence that many novice recreational permit holders uh, are apt to lose or abandon traps. And by giving, uh, by, by creating a, a, a closed season, um, it gives the opportunity for the environmental police to, um, to see the gear, inspect the gear, notify the gear owners, or, or even haul the gear um, if, if possible. Um, and so uh, we think that this is a, a, good, uh, a good time to consider that proposal. When the uh, environmental police patrol waters for gear left during the close season, about half the gear that is found and uh, in, in brought to shore uh, tends to be attributable to recreational permit holders. Next slide, please, slide number 14. Uh, this may be the most substantive proposal that we're bringing forth tonight, and that is to require commercial trap pot fishermen to deploy vertical lines that part when subject to 1,700 pounds of pressure. A recent study produced by the New England Aquarium of Entanglements showed ropes with low breaking strength can reduce serious injury and mortality by at least 72%. Cooperative research with commercial lobstermen have demonstrated that ropes of these breaking strengths are strong enough in most cases to allow successful hauling of lobster gear. In essence, this research and proposal tries to hit the sweet spot for a line that is safe for the industry and beneficial for right whales. Uh, this, uh, to comply with this particular rule, um, it, it, uh, there's gonna be a couple of options, uh, as I mentioned before. One is to have uh, a, a, a contrivance. Um, the South Shore lobstermen have done a, a really good job of developing a uh, sleeve which is a, uh, a device that, that would wrap uh, two ends of a, of a cut rope 
and uh, with a certain attachment technique, uh, 1,700 pounds is a, uh, is a reproducible and consistent breaking strength of that rope. Um, and the other, uh, some rope manufacturers have endeavored to create a rope that is uh, 1,700 pound uh, in, its, in its continuous breaking strength. And that might be a, a good option for some fishermen who, who want to replace their buoy lines in their entirety. Mass Lobstermen's Association have received grants to obtain, distribute, and test rope prototypes that have normal diameters but lower breaking strengths. And, uh, and so we're, we're confident that uh, this is a proposal that, uh, that the industry could, uh, could live with based on all the field testing that's going on. Uh, next slide, please, number 15. The proposed maximum buoy line diameters, uh, uh, this line diameter proposal will prevent excessively strong rope from being fished in the water column in state waters. But we believe most intro fishermen are already fishing line uh, of, of this diameter. One of the biggest challenges in solving the dilemma of entanglements is determining the source of the entangling gear. By making this rule, we can effectively rule out mass state waters whenever any rope is seen uh, on an, a right whale with a diameter large and larger than what is allowed in the state fishery. It should be noticed uh, that amendments to actual buoy line marking is not being proposed in this rulemaking, but will be in next year once the National Marine Fishery Service final rules are proposed. There is strong interest to have a distinct gear mark for each state's lobster fishery and possibly another mark identifying state versus federal waters because fishing within each state, there are some who fishermen who hail from mass ports, but also fish in the EEZ or even exclusively in the EEZ. Those details have yet to be worked out. Um, and so uh, there's, there'll be more to follow at a, at a future public hearing on that. But we felt it was premature at this time to um, make any proposals until NIMS came out with their particular rules. Next slide. The single trap prohibition, the proposal is to prohibit commercial fishermen using vessels larger than 29 feet to fish single traps, and the proposed effective date is 2022. Uh, this uh, particular uh, graph, you can see the gray areas is where single traps are allowed now. Uh, they are, single traps are banned in the state waters portion uh, of, of um, uh, something that's not depicted there is where the uh, state federal waters line is. But in the deeper waters of Cape Cod Bay, deeper waters of Mass Bay, um, single traps are not allowed. Um, the rationale re requires lots of fishing from larger platforms to trawl up their gear, thereby reducing the number of water, uh, I'm sorry, vertical lines in the water column. Uh, it should be noted that fishermen fishing two or more trap trawls are already required to fish only one buoy line, although we don't think there's that many fishermen who actually fish uh, what, what's affectionately known as doubles. Um, fewer vertical lines in the water column um, could reduce the risk of entanglement. Uh, and at the same time, smaller vessels fishing in shore will be allowed to fish single traps to promote fishermen's safety. Next slide, please. The seasonal lobster permit cap, um, the, uh, we're capping the annual seasonal uh, student permits at 150. Uh, that's a little bit higher than, than, uh, than what we've ever, ever issued. We're, we're not seeking to reduce that fishery at all. We just want to cap it. Um, uh, this, this would cap the effort near the current level. Uh, continuing to allow young folks to gain commercial fishing experience and provide a means for young fishermen to enter the commercial fishery. As I mentioned earlier, the particular fishery is set by statute. Uh, which is not something we regulate, but rather it's, it's in state law, limited to 25 traps with that three month season, middle of June to the middle of September. Uh, finally, the housekeeping uh, measures. Uh, like I mentioned before, there's, uh, there's some rewrites of the, of the rules, there's some cleaning up, there's some elimination of, a, of an, the old critical habitat map is still in there. We're, we're seeking to eliminate that. Uh, just, just do a, a good cleanup and a reconsolidation of the rules. 
So um, at this point, uh, next slide on slide number 19. At this point, I think we can um, take questions uh, from the public on the presentation. I do have access to uh, Bob Glenn and Aaron Burke, who are, uh, collectively are, are working uh, with me on the uh, all matters concerning protected species, but also on the incidental take permit application. And of course, Jared Silver, who's the moderator, uh, is, is the person who drafts uh, our legal language. And so if there's any questions on, on any of that, uh, we'd be happy to uh, try to clarify things. So why don't we, um, why don't we take some questions, uh, Jared? Um, and, and if folks could, can simply um, ask questions and, and not editorialize and not get into the comments, we're gonna come back to you for comments. So let's take any technical questions on the presentation. All right, so if you have technical questions, please use the raise hand feature and I will acknowledge you person by person. I'll provide you um, an opera. I'll allow you to talk and you have to unmute yourself once I recognize you. And um, so we'll start with Eric. Eric, you're allowed to talk. Please unmute yourself. Uh, my question is with these added regulations, how will that affect the 60% reduction in risk that NIFS, NIMS wants. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Eric, the answer to that is uh, by and large, these are the regulations that are going to result in the 60% risk reduction. And we're just getting out ahead of these now. Uh, we're fully anticipating that which is gonna be in the federal rules, but right whales will be arriving in our state waters uh, in, a, in a matter of a month. And, um, and we, are, we are preemptively um, are proposing these rules for this winter and, and spring. And I'd ask uh, Bob Glenn uh, if you'd like to add to that. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that Dan is, is correct that this does, this, the baseline for these regulations are what was in our proposal to get us to the 60% but we've added additional things that we anticipate are going to be necessary to both get us distinguished uh, as our own unique fishery on the list of fisheries and also to achieve uh, what's necessary for us to obtain an incidental take permit. Eric, do you have a follow-up question or are you good? Thank you, Eric. Bob Mack. Go ahead. Yeah, I, personally, I'm really confused. I, maybe this wasn't intended for the average person um, who's interested in ocean issues. I'm not necessarily the average person. I curate some ocean films for an art center. But in any, any event, I'm confused as to um, how you can state that a um, 17,000 or 1,700 pound per pressure uh, inch on, on once a right whale was or it did get entrapped ensnared in it um that it that because just because it's not trailing a lobster the pod itself the buoy how that is that, that is acceptable could you i just don't get that and um yeah i just if you could explain to me it just seems to be we've gotten in the weeds here real real early on and maybe it's wasn't intended for someone who didn't have the fuller fuller understanding thank you uh, Thanks, Bob. Dan, I'll take that. Uh, yeah, so that specific um, regulation, the 1700 pound breaking strength line is one that has been proposed and endorsed by the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Team, along with the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, based on studies conducted by the New England Aquarium, a, published, a paper published by Amy, Amy Knowlton et al. in 2015, looking at injury and scarification rates on whales, um, they determined that uh, the preponderance of, of injury um, or serious injury on whales entangled in lighter lines that broke at lower rates was much lower than that, up to as much as 72% lower that in heavy lines. So that is, that's informed by uh, scientific literature um, in, in the uh, peer review, you know, peer-reviewed scientific literature. Thank you. And it can be proven that there's no mortality following that. Um, 
no, no one's saying that anything can be proven. Uh, we're right. saying that the scientific evidence supports that the substantially lower rates of serious injury and mortality based on the metrics that are used by the folks who, who study right well injuries. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Jay Todd. Jay Todd. Want to get back to Jay Todd? I do. Oh, sorry, can you hear, sorry, no? can you hear me? Yep. Yes, I can. So, I'm kind of a, a virgin with this stuff. So um, my question is, um, when, when this uh, closure starts, <clears throat> uh, given that it's only about seven weeks away, I know a lot of people have some trepidation about, uh, you know, the short period of time we're going to have to be able to start getting our gear out um, for February 1st. Um, so I, I guess my question is, are, are there any considerations going to be made given uh, the time of year it is and, and weather uh, considerations that if, if somebody can't get all their gear out uh, of state waters in that time frame, uh, will concessions be made to allow people to uh, be able to get their gear out if it goes beyond that point? Well, um, the rules have not been filed yet. So in order for this rule to go into effect uh, for a February 1st start time, um, we would have to file the rules in, in sufficient time to do that. And, and so it is our intent to get these uh, close to the, to the start date as possible. What we absolutely don't want is, is people to, uh, is fishermen to get seriously injured or killed. Um, trying to remove gear, um, you know, in, in bad weather. And so uh, we understand uh, that it's the worst time of year to be out on the water. Um, my recommendation is um, to stop bringing the gear home now. Um, but I, I, I don't want to sound presumptuous, but we, we've done all we can to try to, you know, work through the industry groups and, and, and try to get the word out that that this has been, um, you know, in, in the works for some time. But uh, history uh, has shown that when we've enacted these kind of rules uh, and there were extenuating circumstances, um, you know, we worked with the environmental police to, to uh, be reasonable. We've also helped fishermen find other fishermen who might be in the water who could help remove the gear. Uh, what we don't want is is for fishermen to wait until January 29th and say, well, geez, it's, it's windy today. I, I can't get the gear. So, um, but we understand that there's uh, some real life uh, uh, realities uh, and, 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 uh, and weather issues and safety issues, but I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to uh, pledge to you that, that this rule wouldn't be um, enforced uh, at that time, but, but we, we, we're reasonable. John Haviland, you're recognized. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jared. Can you hear me? I can, yes, John. Uh, the question is, is that it was stated that we have two minutes. So my question would be, is it two minutes of questioning or is it two minutes of questioning and answer period? The, the, it's, that's particularly for the comment. So if you have a question, go right ahead. Uh, well, I, I have a couple of questions. So I just didn't okay. want to be cut off. Cut go off. ahead. It, it was just stated that uh, the... It has to, on January 7th, there'll be a meeting with the uh, Massachusetts uh, Marine Commission and it has to pass by majority. So if it does, if it does in fact uh, get passed, this is gonna be a two-part question on, on, on A. And that would be, if it does get passed on January 7th, you have the timeline of posting it and it being legal by the end of the month, would that be, a, is that feasible? And of Correct, course, that is feasible. Okay. Second thing is, is that if it did not pass uh, the Marine Commission, then this is all muted and it goes away. Would that be a yes or no answer? That's not quite a yes or no answer. I mean, the director has the authority to revise any recommendation he makes to the Marine Fisheries Commission. If ultimately no recommendation is passed, then the rules cannot change except for an emergency regulation. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question would be uh, the incidental take permit. Uh, does the Division of Marine Fisheries Service have a timeline to which uh, they may be successful to obtain that? Bob, do you want to address yeah, that? I'll take that. Um, so the, 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 the process of obtaining an incidental take permit is an iterative process. Um, we'll be working with National Marine Fisheries Service. In their handbook for, for doing this, they said a, a typical application takes anywhere from two to four years based on pre preliminary cons consultation that we've had with them, ours is not what they would consider an, order, an ordinary one because we're dealing with multiple fisheries um, that we have to get take permit for, as well as multiple species that we have to work with. So the timeline on this for getting is, is somewhere on the order of, of two plus years. Um, Thank you, Bob. Uh, the next question would be, uh, could you tell me how many, if this were to be implemented, uh, and currently the closure is 3,076 square nautical miles between state waters and federal waters, uh, how many more miles total uh, of the closure would the state have? Uh, would it be in the essence of another 2,000 miles or, uh, or, or do you have that information? Uh, John, that's not a calculation that I have right at my fingertips right now, but I'd be happy to get that information for you and follow up directly with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and basically the last question uh, that I have, if I'm still in my two minutes, and that is that uh, in the housekeeping section, it says uh, DMF proposes to revise and update the purpose of the state uh, protected species regulations so that it it better reflects the current approach to managing protected species. Could you elaborate on what type of house cleaning, uh, housekeeping you're going to be doing and, and what the, the new language would be? And do you want me to handle this? Yeah, go ahead, Jared. So John, um, a lot of the, the purpose and scope language was developed back in the 1990s and early 2000s when the protected species regulations went into effect. Um, the Purpose and scope section is being updated to better reflect that a lot of this is a lot of the management of protected species is done through the take re, take reduction teams uh, that we're implementing seasonal closures, all of which is being proposed tonight. the um, The language that is currently there is is rather outdated in terms of what it references. Um, you know, it, it deals a lot with the the prior regime, the critical habitat area and um, what was on the books and what was being developed uh, about 20 years ago. So this would be an update to bring us up to what is being done now. All right, thank you. And, and the last question, if I have the time, and that would be a 1700 pound contrivance. Um, I know that uh, the state of uh, Maine has been working on, did, uh, let me rephrase that, has, has done a study in regards to a knot in a vertical line would cut the uh, breaking strength by 50%. Uh, I don't know how, uh, if that's moving forward or not, but the question that I pose would be, how is anyone going to uh, actually verify or law, enforce, law enforcement is going to obtain that my vertical line breaks at 1,700 pounds? I'll take this, Dan. So, John, what we're doing right now is we're um, we're in the you know early stages of working with National Marine Fishery Service as well as the other states to come up with a list of contrivances and/or options, equipment options that fishermen can use to achieve the 1,700 pound. The metric that National Marine Fishery Service has put forward is that they have to be repeatable, enforceable, and measurable. Um, and so those three metrics. The other thing in, in you know, Maine has been testing some knots um, and we've had some, some conference calls with a group of gear people relative to that. Um, and all I can say is, while there's nothing definitive at this point, um, I know that National Maine Fisheries Service has expressed concerns about using knots as one of the possible contrivances because it's not necessarily re repeatable or enforceable because a knot, as you very well know, could be a knot in what size line and not, you know, a knot on what breaking strength or what type of line doesn't necessarily break at 1700 pounds. And that, and there's also ex concern expressed by folks who work on the disentanglement team that knots tend to get caught in the baleen kind of like a jam cleat. And so um, it's my anticipation, although it's 
it's preliminary that that knots may not be on on the approved list although i cannot comment with 100 percent confidence because there is not a list yet of authorized options by national marine fishery service one, one last follow-up bob that you just mentioned and i didn't have this until you made the statement and that is that so when would that contrivance if this were to go into effect uh, february 1st uh let me think. This is what December uh, 8th, I believe. So, uh, when would we find out what a legal contrivance would be before February 1st? And would there be then enough time to which the industry can change their vertical lines? Sure. Um, right. And so, you know, you're, you're aptly pointing out that the timeline here is difficult. So, a couple things. As first is, it would be the closure would be in effect on February 1st. The open season wouldn't be at least until May 1st, so it gives us a little bit more time. Still short, though. Um, out of the gate, we're confident right now that the two things that would be improved right off the bat are the South, are the South Shore sleeves as well as 1,700 pound line that we can, you know, we we can we've had you know we get samples of have broken and have shown that it can break at 1,700. Um, both NIMS and, and DMF and, and Maine DMR. Uh, gear people are working with manufacturers on getting additional samples of other um, line and that we you know, anticipate to purchase more distribute to the in industry to test. And so um, we're, we're moving forward as we can. If for some reason we can't get enough options on the table um, you know, in time, uh, then you know, we'll, you know, at this point, we haven't had a, you know, we haven't implemented the rule. And so full imp implementation or as an implementation for National Marine Fishery Service, um, they haven't published their rules yet. yet. So we don't know what those are, um, but we're, you know, understand your concerns and, and we're working to uh, address them. Uh, I'd like to thank Jared as the moderator for giving me the time to ask these questions. End of message. Thank you, John. David Abel. David Abel, you can unmute yourself. Yes, hi, sorry, can you hear me? I can, David. Okay, great, uh, thank you. Uh, so I had a few questions. Uh, the first is, I'd appreciate if you could tell me roughly how many lobstermen this will affect. Uh, and just so everybody knows, this is David Abel, I'm a reporter with the Boston Globe. Um, uh, and has there been any study of the economic impact of these regulations and how it might affect uh, many of the fishermen uh, and their bottom line? And then finally, uh, at, well, the next is you, you talked a bit about when you expect this, these regulations to take effect, but is it fair for me to say that uh, the goal is to have them com completed by February 1st? Um, uh, and uh, why don't you start with that? And I have one more question after that. Well, David, uh, this is Dan. So let me give a, a, a partial answer to the first one. How many will this affect? Um, uh, we aren't, I mean, the whole population of state waters permit holders is around, uh, of active permit holders is around 800. Um, but um, about over a hundred of them have federal permits. So. Uh, we're not sure uh, that they'll, that gear will all come home. It might be shifted into the EEZ. Uh, we do know that during those months, the annual landings of, um, of lobsters is about uh, 3% of, uh, of the total. It, it's under 5% on an annual basis of, of the total. Uh, we presume that the lobsters that aren't captured will still be there when the fishing starts in May. Uh, we do recognize that there is a uh, that there is a burden attributable to having to bring the gear home and put the gear back out. Um, but we don't have any uh, any estimates of that at this time. But um, we we could um, we could try to get that for you. I would appreciate that. And my uh, other question is, what is DMF's plan? if NIMPS doesn't provide an incidental take permit? And would that potentially require that the fishery be closed, the lobster fishery and um, all fixed gear fisheries be closed entirely for the whole year? 
I think that's a question up to the courts because um, if that's what you're asking, that that's what the litigation is about. Uh, as far as uh, the the state waters fishery, uh, it, it it does resemble um, fisheries in, in other jurisdictions. Um, so uh, it would surprise me if the uh, if the fishery had to be closed for a failure to get an ITP, uh, but we are working to get the ITP and are willing to uh, modify our management strategies to meet those meet those goals. Okay, and uh, thank you. So if you guys could provide me any more specifics on the numbers uh, of fishermen that would affect and any uh, more specifics on, on economic impacts, that would be great. Um, and um, uh, finally, John Havlin asked how this will be enforced. Um, can you, uh, I, I didn't hear an answer to that. Can you say a little bit more about how you would, how uh, DMF would know that there would be breaking, that everybody will be using breaking strength, that, um, uh, that people won't be fishing during specific times? Well, the, as far as John's question about how it will be enforced, uh, the, the two most common uh, methods of, of rigging the, the gear, uh, of, well, the one most common one is one that John himself developed with a, a company uh, called Nova Braid that uh, creates the sleeve. And uh, John's worked very hard to um, help create the, the methods of, of rigging that gear. And so we're confident that that is something that is inspectable. If fishermen wanted to use their existing vertical line rope, uh, make a cut in it, and then reattach it with the sleeve, it is a reproducible uh, method. As far as uh, breaking strength rope, uh, Mass Lobstermen's Association and others are working with gear manufacturers to create a rope that is uh, that is unique in its in its look in terms of the you know the tracers and the style and and so I'm 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 imagining that that the 1,700 pound rope is rope that is going to um, be recognizable um, in terms of its uh, if its shape its its feel um, and coming from the manufacturer. Uh, will be certified as such. Um, it would be obviously difficult if if this 1,700 pound rope that is being manufactured for the industry was coming in all shapes and sizes. That obviously presents uh, a more a more difficult challenge for enforcement. Well, will um, there be will, will there be state uh, environmental police actually hauling gear to check that that you know? Um, I apologize for that. So your your question is, will the environmental police be hauling the gear uh, during the closure? No, I'm I'm saying during during the post closure when you would expect the uh, breaking strength rope to be universally used. Let's say in May, um, would like how would you know? I mean, given the thousands of uh, vertical buoy lines that are used, I mean, will how how you know will the state know? That people are not just using their other rope uh, and have actually, you know, uh, adhering to the regulations. Will environmental police actually be like hauling traps to check? Yeah, it can be hauled and inspected. Uh, well, environmental police can board the boat while the boat is hauling the gear. The uh, the environmental police and DMF do have, uh, you know, vessels with haulers that we could look at at that. Um, but I'm expecting a fair amount of compliance um, with the with the industry because this has been in the works for oh, for at least two years, and I know that the uh, that the association and a lot of the the industry leaders um, have taken this seriously, and um, I'm not expecting uh, a whole lot of non-compliance. Okay, this will be my fi final question. Um, it, it it might be expensive for a lot of these fishermen to buy additional rope or or use sleeves in their rope is the state uh envisioning any state or federal aid to support that transition dan i'll i'll take this yep um so yeah D david we're we have a couple of different initiatives going on one is a grant that we receive uh from national marine fishery service um which we to assist the mass lobster industry with transitioning over to weak rope and weak contrivances. Um, with that grant, we've all already bought um, 
over 4,000 South Shore sleeves and 450 coils of rope um, that we're planning to start to distribute um, and have staff work with them to also come up with additional contrivances that we can have uh, tested and approved. Um, in addition to that, we're hoping to get some additional state level funding that's in the works, uh, which would double those efforts relative to buying additional gear that we would we plan to distribute to the in industry at no cost. So while we can't completely defer 100% of the cost, uh, we're doing our best to try to uh, take a fairly big chunk out of it. How much roughly? Uh, to total funding initially is right now in hand is 200,000. And as I said, we're hoping that that doubles. Thank you very much. Damien P, you may unmute yourself, you are recognized. Yeah, I also had some questions about the um, breaking strength, the 1700 pound breaking strength. Uh, I think one had been when it would be required. I think that was answered for um, the upcoming season in May. Um, also, if, if using sleeves, would it be one, one breaking point per, per uh, buoy line or would there be required multiple breaking points per buoy line? And um, is there any estimate cost yet on, on the sleeves themselves and the availability of the sleeves? to cover all fishermen. Bob, are you available to respond to that? Uh, yeah, um, so cut out for a second, but I think I, what the question that I heard was, is, is how, many, how many places are there gonna have to be weak um, links within the rope and what is an estimate of the cost? Is that? Is that yes, correct? that's it, yep. Okay, uh, so right now, um, What's proposed in, in the federal rules that we anticipate are going to come out is that you're going to have to have a weak link in three spots, one in each third of the buoy line. Um, the cost of a link of a weak link, uh, I believe, is about five dollars each. Don't quote me on that. It's on. I don't have the invoice right in front of me. I can look it up and, and put it in the chat in a second. Uh, but it's um, it's roughly that. Uh, the availability wise. We just ordered 4,000 of them and it took about two weeks to get from Nova Braid. So they're, they're readily available and, and Nova Braid is aware of these uh, regulations and, and anticipates that there's likely to be more demand. Um, so I don't think getting them will be a problem. Damien, do you have a follow-up question? No, that's it, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, just give me a moment, please. Neil, you are recognized. Please unmute yourself. Hi there. I want to state that I'm a recreational or uh, I'm going to say more importantly, a subsistence fisherman. I do not fish commercially just for recreational and, and, uh, and subsistence. What I sort of reading between the lines and the legislation as proposed is is a rather un, a rather biased and unfair balance of, of uh, <clears throat> favoring the commercial guys over recreational guys to the extent you're going to limit the the cut the uh, recreational um, uh, season by seven months down to four down to five months and I, I think that's a little yeah. Yeah, Neil, I think that falls in the in the comment category. So um, do you have a particular question? Because we're in the question period here. Okay, I want to understand how that got written into the legislation. I looked through the, the initial draft and, and there is no differentiation between commercial and recreational fishing in that draft, but it shows it to be struck, struck out. And then uh, the, the, I want to say it's part four of that section that, that that limits the recreational guys where did sure. that yeah i mean that, that originated from us uh you know based on the survey of permit holders we've we believe that the vast majority of permit holders fish about a five-month season um you know in in most of the cases when we find abandoned gear and we reach out to the to the owners um 
those those they've stopped fishing for months and so um but so anyway so it's it's well, we think it's sort of consistent with how the fishery is conducted now but you know a general it's not fair for me to generalize that everybody fishes that way so when we get to the comment section uh, feel free to to set us straight on on how you fish and what you think uh, uh if there should be a closure or not so um but we can get to that okay thank you i i Mm -hmm. Sorry to cut you off there, Neil. I uh, got a little quick with the trigger. We'll look forward to your comment. Mike Lane. Yeah. Mike Lane, you're recognized. You're going to mute yourself. All right. Can you hear me? I can, Mike. Okay. My first question, I guess, would be uh, how many whale entanglements can be uh, traced back to the mass lobsterman? in the last six years of the closure? Zero. Okay. Um, and is there a review process for this closure if we have a distributional shift of whales out of this area? This, is this gonna be uh, reviewed every two, four, five years? And you know, in, it, it's gonna be some time when these whales will move out of this area and not return. And as we know, we have a closure in the Great South Channel, which there's no whales are present, and the still the closure exists. Are we going to have a re review process for this? Mike, it's my understanding that every three years, our incidental take permit will be reviewed, and, and it'll be determined whether or not we could still, if we're giving it, uh, if we still maintain the necessary um, no injury to deter negligible impact determination. Um, it's at that time where uh, yeah, every regulation would, would be reviewed. Um, potentially things that are um, not, you know, not deemed necessary could be uh, relaxed. And it's also possible that we other additional measures could be, could be levied at that point. Okay, so this could be, uh, if there was a closure put in place, this could be reversed, pending the whales leave for, you know, X amount of years Sorry. and don't show up again. Um, my last question would be, uh, is the word in this, is this going to be a pot trap closure? Um, I don't know where I'm going with this one. No, go ahead, Mike. No, I'm just saying, is the word going to be, it's going to be a pot trap closure, uh, you know, as, as on the federal level, where they're trying to reverse that rule and to uh, allow some ropeless fishing. Are we going to have the same uh, word where it's going to, you know, stifle uh, ropeless fishing? No, and, no. Okay, and um, I guess is uh, what about um, longline gear? But if we want to, uh, you know, put you know, go hooking for haddock in April, is this going to be this? So that's going to stop that from occurring. Uh, you know what I mean? That's a good question, and I would suggest that you make that comment. It's my understanding with longline gear is the gear is deployed and and within um, minutes of the last hook being put out, it's retrieved. Well, so uh, no, a lot of the longline gear will be is deployed and then uh, l usually left overnight or during a high cost tie, then retrieved. You know, ten twelve hours later. Yep, um, that's so. that's a good point. So uh, if I were you, I would. Uh, uh, feel free to make that comment that, uh, in, the, in the comment in the section. Comment. Yep. Okay. Yeah, because I just, you know, trying to plan for future fisheries. I mean, we have a closure. This is really going to, this will really close down the whole state to any type of income being made. Uh, you know, just trying to figure mm -hmm. out what else we can do when we take the traps in to, you know, put I'm something in our pockets. Yep. All right. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Q half yard. You recognize you can unmute yourself. Q half yard. Hello. Hello, I can hear you. Oh, good. Right. Thank you. Um, yes, with the um, the 1700 pounds uh, breaking strain of the lines as proposed. Um, the figures are that that would um, alleviate 72% of uh, um, 
Wales being uh, uh, damaged, is that right? Affected in some way? Uh, presumably that leaves 28% uh, who are affected substantially. Um, what exactly does that mean? Um, and uh, with the current levels of uh, population, um, is there any kind of projection, any kind of modeling that's been done on uh, what effect that would have on the long-term uh, levels of population? I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Uh, so first and foremost is, is that that 72% figure is in the in the is a reduction in the severity of entanglement and so that's in the in a case where an entanglement occurs uh, the outcome is 72 percent less likely to cause serious injury um, in the event that it happens in the Common, commonwealth of massachusetts we have two entanglements that are attributable to massachusetts lobster fishing gear in state waters uh, since 2009 and the, or ever that's that's we don't have we have two right whale entanglements attributable to that uh, in both cases those animals were successfully disentangled and released mm -hmm. um, and so what we're saying is the 1700 pound line in the event that an entanglement does occur which is an extraordinarily unlike uh, unusual event in in the commonwealth of massachusetts that mm -hmm. if that does happen it's likely to reduce the severity of injury by a substantial portion Right. Thank you. Tom McShane. Hi, thank you. Um, Dan or Bob, either one of you. Dan stated that um, these regulations would achieve the 60% risk reduction that the TRT is looking for. Uh, my question is that given that the Endangered Species Act requires less than one death per year, and yet we've seen 32 deaths since 2017, um, how can we get an incidental take permit? And aren't we going to have to do more? Yeah, and I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> To get an incidental take permit, we, we will have to go through a new NEPA review and they'll have to determine that the risk posed by the Massachusetts lobster fishery does not pose a, a you know, a, a substantial risk. So they call it neg negligible impact determination. If they determine that, that the regulations in place, the monitoring program, mitigation measures we have in place are sufficient, then we would get it. Um, Again, in this particular case, we're talking about the state waters of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. When you talk about the 32 right whale entanglements, none of those are attributable to state waters fishing gear. Um, over half of those are attributable to Canada. Uh, a portion are attributable to ship strikes, and there is some other portion attributable to US fishing gear. If you look at the entanglement record, a large port, the vast majority of all those are entanglements and in, in mortalities that have occurred in very large diameter fishing line, line in excess of a half inch in diameter. That gear is not gear that is used in state waters. We use small, much smaller diameter lines. So it's more indicative of rope that is used either in, in typically in offshore lobster or in many cases, what we're finding in recent years, even in the entanglements that are found in, in United States waters are indicative of Canadian snow crab gear. And, and the question that I, I guess the, the important follow-up question that I have is that given the fact that we all want to save the industry and the whales, um, why can we not talk about ropeless fishing gear at this point? It seems that's the way, one way that we can save both the industry and the whales and at least remove the current state regulation that requires rope. I'll take a crack at that, Bob. Um, we certainly can talk about uh, ropeless. We talk about it every day, uh, but at, at this point, the technology uh, to allow fishermen to see each other's gear 
uh, so that they don't set over one another, and so that draggers don't set over or, or plow through um, someone else's gear. Um, that that's not ready for prime time. And there's, uh, I know there's a substantial amount of investment going in to the questions of how to be able to detect the presence of the gear, but um, vertical lines are fished for safety reasons. And um, we are very uh, apprehensive about uh, the impacts of, of um, fishermen setting over one another, not only similar gears, but competing gears uh, or different gears. And this is a work in progress. Tonight's proposals are for regulations changes. Um, we don't feel that we could in, in good faith um, at this point have lobstermen um, set unbuoyed gear uh, without uh, excluding the, the other gears from that area. And we just haven't uh, endeavored to do that yet, uh, mainly because we're, we're waiting for that technology to be developed to be able to detect the gear. There's no question that pop-up buoys can work. Um, if, you're the, if, you're, if you're the only person fishing in the ocean, you can certainly hide your, your, your traps on the ocean floor and flip a switch and get that buoy to pop to the surface. The challenge is allowing fishermen to coexist side by side uh, with one another. Um, a typical lobster trawl from one end to the, to the other is about um, a quarter to a half mile long. Uh, traps are typically spaced between uh, 90 and 180 feet apart and, um, and are fished in, in trawls of uh, 10 to 25. So you can see how the, the, the challenges of not being able to see uh, another fisherman's gear uh, and the problems that could cause. We also know there was a vessel uh, that was sunk about seven or eight years ago off of Provincetown when it encountered a, a long string of lobster traps. It was a small scalloper when, when, the, when, the, uh, when the gear was brought up high above the vessels, uh, it, it, was, uh, it altered the center of gravity and the boat flipped and the captain was lost. So there were some serious um, uh, you know, unintended consequences of, of going to a, a ropeless fishery. Uh, and that's why we're not talking about it tonight because it needs more work. In, in terms of Bob, I think it was mentioned that we're hoping to go from $200,000 to $400,000 worth of funding for the weak rope, which seems to be, uh, to be honest with you, um, not gonna get the job done. Uh, are we willing to invest that kind of resources into solving the problem of making sure that lobstermen can see each other's gears for ropeless? Yeah, I, you know what, I, I, you're, you're, you're drifting into the comment section. I think that's a rhetorical okay. question. Um, okay, so, so the, how much um, are we, I guess the question is, how much are we spending on that technology? The Commonwealth has received a grant from the national, uh, uh, I'm sorry, from the ASMFC uh, to uh, assist fishermen in, in um, transitioning over to this gear. So it's not just the gear itself, but it's also a, uh, you know, a, an employee to, uh, to work with the fishermen on some of these breakaway features that's already baked into what we think is gonna be the federal plan, um, plus the materials involved. Um, so that's, that's short money uh, because we do anticipate that uh, at the current uh, price of these pop-up devices, uh, it would cost around $100 million to outfit the uh, Massachusetts fishery. And so um, I can't speak to what resources we have except, uh, or that we'd like to have, except what resources we do have. And Bob described the grant that we got to assist fishermen to make this particular transition. Right. Well, let's Thank stick you. to questions because we want to get going here and, um, and start to take comments because Tom, it sounds like that's a comment you want to make. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Tom. O.S. You're recognized. You can unmute yourself. O.S. O.S. I'm going to come back to you. Chuck Gilchrist. You can unmute yourself. You're recognized. 
Thank you very much. Um, full disclosure, I am uh, a representative for uh, Nova Braid, the company that is um, manufacturing the uh, South Shore sleeves. And my question was, um, <laughs> If we're going to be an essential part of the supply chain for some of these contrivances, it would be very, uh, and I don't mean to negate what was said earlier, it would be very, very helpful if uh, some of the regulatory folks would actually reach out to Nova Braid to be able to discuss the scope of what's going to be necessary uh, should these um, items get put into, into place. And to that end, um, it was discussed as to, um, you know, how, how many are we, we anticipating using? Now, there was, uh, in one of the slides, it did say that there was, um, that only one vertical line per, uh, per, uh, per, per trawl would be allowed. So- No, 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 that's not true. Oh, okay, uh, I'll go back to, uh, uh, I don't know if that was the- it's For doubles and triples only. So for doubles and triples. Okay, that was not, okay. So uh, a normal trawl will will still allow be allowed uh, two vertical lines. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, so what are we anticipating here? You you folks have a pretty good idea as to how many um, how many lobster licenses that were uh, that were issued and how many traps are allowed. Well, it's a, so it'd be it's really a, nice for us to do, know yeah. what we're going to need to make. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, the, the calculation's even a little bit more uh, elaborate because it's not just traps times permits, it's uh, the configuration. And we do uh, receive from every commercial lobsterman uh, an annual report of how many vertical lines they, they fish. And, um, but I, I will be glad to get back to you with that answer um, this week to okay. forecast that for sure. But, I believe um, Rob Martin gave gave you my uh, my contact information, and that okay. would be helpful. Yeah, the, the only thing I would other add in, Dan, that's difficult to estimate is we don't know, we don't have a sense of how many fishermen are going to opt for a Nova braid sleeve versus the full 1700 pound rope versus splicing in a piece of 1700 pound rope or what what potential other contrivances are. So even if, ever, you know, it's a tough thing for us to estimate because we don't know what each one of our fishermen are going to opt for. But I do know that th these regulations relative to 1700 pound are not just being proposed in Massachusetts. They are part of the federal rule that is slated to come up. I'll finish that for Bob. It's slated to come out um, as a proposed uh, final rule in the next uh, month or so, and it's expected to be a uh, final, final rule by the end of May. Well, pretty difficult to exactly quantify. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, pr I appreciate that. Um, I, I know that, that, in, uh, that Maine was not being... Uh, they were questioning uh, some of the, the findings for the take reduction team and uh, have they now switched uh, their their tack? If uh, we've got Maine, Mainers uh, fishing down in, in, in Massachusetts waters. It, it currently, as, as I understand it, and again, I can't, I can't say with 100% certainty because NIMS has not published their final rule, but it is my understanding that that will be a requirement for all state waters fishermen uh, in Maine, Massachusetts, et cetera. Thank you very much. Jared, are we ready to get to comments? We have a couple more questions, Dan. Okay. Um, we have Lita Zimmerman. Hi there. Thanks very much for taking my questions. I just have a couple quick ones. Um, and first, I just want to give a shout out to uh, fishermen in Massachusetts waters. Uh, you're deeply appreciated and you're doing essential work. So just know that. Um, uh, first question is the 1700 pound rope. Is that, uh, that's been researched, but does that also apply to, is that the kind of force that a younger right whale such as the right whales that are that are now on their way up, the calves that are coming up uh, could could uh, actually escape from. No, 
uh, a juvenile right whale could not escape from 1700 pound. However, um, our fishery will be closed at the time of year in which we've ever seen calf right whales in our waters. Okay, because I, I just heard that uh, two, there's news today that, that there are two, two young ones that are uh, spotted off Georgia today. So uh, that's good news. Uh, second question um, is the degree to which there is cooperation with Canada at this point to protect uh, the right whales. Is, is everybody coming together uh, around the same measures? So um, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, classify it that everyone's coming around those measures. It's kind of a complicated thing. Uh, I sit on several, I sit on the take reduction team. I sit on the Northeast uh, recovery, right whale recovery implementation team. Canada is a, 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 at the table at all those deliberations and discussions. Um, and certainly I know that both our state government as well as the federal government has put a lot of pressure on Canada to come up to speed to make their regulations uh, more stringent. Canada has opted for more of a dynamic uh, area closure system whereby they close fisheries and open fisheries um, based on aerial surveillance. Um, they've had some success with it, but, and, but also some other failures because it's also, it's very dependent on when they can get out. Um, as far as weak ropes and other things, I, I'm not sure, but you know, certainly they, they're aware of what we're doing. We're aware of what they're doing, uh, but you know, we, we have no, um, no say over ultimately what they. And he's gone. Oh, cut out again. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, think, I think I got the gist of that. Um, and, and just the, the last fast, uh, fast question, um, so the 60% risk reduction that you're aiming for, uh, is there an actual number of, of uh, right whale takings that can be uh, translated when you offer that 60% risk reduction that, that are considered acceptable for the, the permit you're seeking? I think we lost Bob. Um, so your question is, would you repeat the question? Come sure. Um, I, I believe I heard one of you say earlier that you are looking for a 60% risk reduction in your new regulations. Is that correct in terms of uh, the impacts on the right way? Actually, no. Um, no. What is the, the, risk the, the 60 Well, the 60% reduction is what the take reduction team endeavored to do throughout the range in the, within the United States. I see. And then... Uh, we are contributing to that, and now with so that's as I mentioned in my one of my earlier slides. There's there's the conservation that that is to meet the 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 spirit and the terms of the take reduction plan, and then here comes the litigation with our incidental take permit um, uh, application. So we believe that uh, there is more than 60% uh, risk reduction because. We are now talking about closing all of state waters during those three months. I see. And we and the fact that we keep our waters closed as we have over the last six or seven years in early May when right whales linger uh, gives gets us a lot of credit with the with the National Marine Fishery Service modelers when they try to calculate risk. They look at that action that we take annually and they they give us a ton of credit for that. Okay, and final, final, the, the, there is no way to identify the fishing gear injuries that some of these whales carry with them. Is that correct? We don't know if, if, you know, if they've been injured and have lost the gear. Do we, we don't know whether they're weakened by gear from Massachusetts or from some other state. Is that correct? I'll well, take this. Yeah, I'll, go I'll ahead, Bob. This, Dan. So, so in order for a fishing gear to be dangerous to a whale, whales and the fishing gear have to overlap in space and time. Massachusetts Coastal Waters hosts up to two thirds of the entire world population of right whales in Cape Cod Bay uh, at a time of year, typically between February and April. Our fishery is closed during that time. There are no vertical lines in that area. Uh, Here he goes, all right. I'm going to, I'm done. I, I want to give other people an opportunity. Thank you. 
All right, Dan, we have seven more questions at the end of these. I'll, I'm going to cut off new okay, questions that come up. Go ahead. Jeff Kuna or Jeff Kana. And, and fix fishing gear. As yeah, good, good evening, DMF. Jeffrey Kana down on Martha's Vineyard. I'm visually impaired, Dan, and I was trying to see your slides. It looks like uh, a lot of these proposals are for Cape Cod Bay and Mass Bay. But when I hear like the 29 foot and greater uh, vessel fish and recreational must be on a 10 pot trawl, that's for all state waters. Uh, yes, the for the lobster fishery. Right. For the, but lobster. the proposal is not for all vessels 29 feet or greater to be on a 10 pot trawl, but just to fish trawled gear. Right. For recreational. Mm -mm. No, commercial only. Commercial only, okay. But there are some recreational proposals in there that would affect, say, Nantucket Sound and Vineyard Sound. The seasonal closure from Columbus Day to Memorial Day would affect the entire recreational lobster fishery, as right. would the 5 16 inch diameter buoy line for the recreational lobster fishery. Okay, so... My question is, what about subtitle aquaculture gear in those areas? There's been no made no mention of it at all. And I'm not sure if what a, if there are any in Mass Bay and Cape Cod Bay, but there there is some in Vineyard Sound and Nantucket Sound. I know that's not what this uh, public hearing is regarding, but maybe you could speak to that before you let me go. Yeah, we are not intending on uh, regulating uh, subtitle aquaculture gear. Almost all of it is very, very close to shore. And uh, we do have, uh, uh, you know, guidelines about keeping the lines under tension and marking the line. But we, we, uh, we don't believe that that is, is a necessary um, thing for us to regulate at this time. Okay. I, I think I'm going to need to talk to you more on that later. But thank you for answering the questions. Okay. Yeah. Brian Sharp, you're recognized. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you, DMF, for uh, hosting this um, uh, hearing today. Um, quick clarifying question on the 1,700-pound uh, uh, breaking contrivances. How is that different than the existing weak link uh, legislation? Because in looking through the, uh, the strike through version, weak links are still in there, but then uh, the section has been added about the 1,700 pound contrivances. Bob, are you on? Yep, I'm here, Dan. Um, so, so Brian, you're talking about the original weak links. Those are specific only to the buoy itself and how, where it's attached, not to the, the multiple locations where a weak rope or weak contri or contrivance or sleeve has to be implemented in the buoy line. So there will be further um, stipulations that come along showing where those need to be in the in the buoy line? Yep. Yes, we're, we're anticipating that they'll be required in multiple locations. Again, we're, we're a little hesitant to define that exactly because we're trying to make it sync up with the federal rules and what every other state is going to be doing. Uh, but it, our anticipation, it'll be in multiple locations along the buoy line. Okay, thank you. Michael Asi. Hey, can you hear me? I can, Michael. Hey, my question, uh, it's in regards to the no trawl zone off Gosnold down in Buzzards Bay, um, where you're prohibiting single trap fishing to anything greater than 29 feet. Is that going to open up the no trawl zone? And will there be a minimum and or maximum trawl length? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there, for those on the call uh, who aren't aware, there's this uh, very ancient state law uh, that goes back uh, many, many, many decades that uh, requires in the, in the uh, town waters of Gosnold, which is around the Elizabeth Island chain from Cuddyhunk to, um, to uh, Gosh, Gosh. Um, 
only uh, if, if anybody fishes lobster traps, they must be set as singles, uh, one trap, one buoy line, one buoy. And um, obviously that particular rule is, is inconsistent with some of our management uh, proposals moving forward. And we have asked um, the, the, uh, the governor's office to file legislation to uh, repeal that particular uh, rule. Uh, we think it's out of date and, um, and should be amended. But as far as maximum uh, length, uh, we don't we don't see that happening. And and again, this wouldn't be a mandate to do away with singles, but it would be a and um, in, in, in terms of the statutory uh, change, it would be an uh, an allowance for trawls. But okay. the other this other rule would apply, you know, the, and about thirty feet and greater would have to go to um, some kind of a multiple pot. Um, trawl doubles triples something okay so nothing greater than 29 feet would be able to fish a single right okay right that's right uh, yeah that's all i got thank you and, you know and i just want to add that in a future round of rulemaking um when we when we uh, get into the weatherback turtle uh issues um that will be addressed uh, more specifically that's cassoni Good evening, Jared Silva, Dan McCannon, and Bob Glenn. Thank you so much. I'd like to say thank you to everyone for your previous questions. I just have a couple of clarifying questions. Um, I know there's a lot of um, questions around coloration. Uh, states have already chosen colors, and it was brought to our attention last night that if Massachusetts is thinking about orange as a color, we might want to rethink that because it's it's um, indicative of the snow crab fishery in Canada. So I guess that's a question for Bob. So Beth, um, I'm aware of that, but the only thing I'm, I'm not too worried about is that the snow crab fishery in Canada uses three quarter inch line and we're gonna ah. have a ban on anything over three eighths. So, um, it, I mean, yes, we could, we could pick a different color if that makes sense, but um, no, nope, that's, that's certainly that's, something we can discuss offline. Yeah, and Beth, the reason that we're not proposing any um, specific uh, marking at this time tonight is because we are actually waiting uh, for NIMS to come out with their uh, proposed final rules. And it's still uh, being debated and discussed as to whether or not we can accommodate having not only a Massachusetts mark, but then a EEZ versus State Waters Massachusetts mark and whether or not it's better to have the EEZ fishermen fish a second level of marking or the state waters fishermen. So you can see that the more you mark and the more you try to slice the, the, uh, the, fishery, the, the population of fishermen and, and, and the geography, um, it gets kind of complicated. And we know that a lot of fishermen fish from state to federal waters, either side of, a, of an imaginary line. And so um, this is still a work in progress. Okay, and then I just have a follow up uh, question on the 1700 pound vertical line. Um, the Massachusetts Lobstermen's Association in conjunction with the Lobster Foundation uh, purchased $50,000 of the red 1700 pound vertical line and has distributed over 700 coils. So now we have a 2.0 version and it looks like a candy cane, which um, we've sent some samples up to Maine to be tested and National Marine Fishery Service has kind of nodded that they like the distinction because it's identifiable. My question is, can we still use the red, red rope that's breaking at 1700 pounds and now this red candy cane rope because we don't wanna just throw 50, actually we purchased another four pallets of it. So we just don't wanna throw $65,000 away. Right. Bob, you with us? Uh, yeah, I I'm sorry, I'm, I keep losing internet service here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I missed most of your question, Beth. I apologize. It's about the red rope that we purchased previously the, with the, the candy cane rope. I heard that. No, nope, previous, not the candy cane. The red rope, the first version, it's all red. Mm -hmm. So we want to know if we can still use it um, because now we've kind of moved on to the candy cane rope, and Nymphs likes the coloration, so. We don't want to just discard sixty-five thousand dollars worth of rope that's a year old. 
Yeah, no, that I, I, I agree hundred percent. And we have, I just purchased a bunch of that to distribute it as well. Um, okay. Bottom line is, is that the rope has to break at 1700 pounds and it does. Regardless. So yeah, the, we're not going to, there's still going to have to be orange if color orange is, is the color from Massachusetts. You still have to put orange marks in that. So it doesn't matter what color that the underlying uh, weak rope is. Okay. And then I have a technical comment. Um, some of our board members weren't able to get on tonight. Um, just, I don't know what happened earlier, but a, a bunch of guys texted me and said they couldn't get on the meeting. So I'll put it up on YouTube and they have tomorrow night to get on too. So sure. that's it from me. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. All right, Dan, we're down to two last questions. Um, Steve, you're up. Steve? Yep, can you hear me? I can, Steve. All right, so so I have a question. Um, these three week links, <clears throat> obviously I, I get it. Um, it's no different than the three red marks that we use now. My question is, is is we move from say 12 feet of water to 200 feet of water throughout the course of the, of the summer months when we're fishing. Um, what, what do we do or, or if we reef the end line up when we're in 12 feet of water, are we still required to have these three, these three break on, you know, weak links or is there, is there some kind of, is there some gray area there? I mean, I, I, I can't move these things around and I can't put 30 of them in an end line. Um, is, is, I yes. mean, is that, if, yeah, I, if the EPOs come out and check us and, and we're reefed up and there's only one week link because there's a reef in the gear, I mean, is that acceptable? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, yeah, the answer to your question is yes. And I'm also going to recognize Erin Burke, who's on the phone. Um, she can talk a little bit more about the specifics of how many weak links uh, are going to be necessary. It's going to be relative to where you where you're fishing. Erin, uh, can mm -hmm. you can you unmute yourself? Hi. Um, so you know, as we've mentioned before, we're not sure what's going to be in the federal rule, but what we proposed um, through the um, when when the feds were working with the states um, to put proposals into this new rule. Um, from the coast to three miles, it's one week contrivance at 50% down the buoy line. From three miles to 12 miles, it's two week contrivances, one in the top 25% of the line and one at 50% down. When you're 12 miles um, out to the LMA3 border, it's one week contrivance in the top 35% down. Um, so there's, ne I mean, there's never been discussion about a, a week um, point at the at the bottom of the buoy line, you know, for safety reasons. Steve, you have a follow up question? Uh, no, <clears throat> no, I, I, so it, so it, it it's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to follow this. So it, according to that, there's only, there's only one weak link. Is that right? And then as we put add-ons on, each add-on would have to have its own weak link, basically? I mean, it depends on how far from shore you're fishing, you know, obviously. Well, I, I go from 12 feet to over 600 feet. So, you know what I mean? As we move out through the, through the months. So it's... Right. Well, depending, you know, based on what we propose through the take reduction um, rules, you know, depending on your distance from shore, the number of contrivances and their location in the buoy line would change. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. OS, I'm coming back to you. You're on mute. You can unmute yourself. You hear me? I can. Yeah, I'm Garrett Lopardo. How do you guys come up with the 29 feet? Is that the vessel length for the single trap rule? Yes. I just don't oh. understand that one bit. So it. 
so the cutoff relative to the, the, the vessel length is we were trying to find a size of a vessel of which um, we felt that vessels above that size could safely deploy uh, doubles. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, it's arbitrary because I'm sure there are some fishermen who are on smaller vessels who would then 29 feet who would feel comfortable fishing uh, doubles. Um, but by and large, um, we look at, you know, most of our vessels that fish singles right now, it's usually much smaller vessels. We only have a handful of vessels who fish larger vessel, who fish singles. Well, I, I fish outer Cape. You guys are very familiar with that. We're historically a single trap fishery and we're pretty much compromised. 30 to 35 foot boats. There's a couple bigger boats, but we all fish single traps. I mean, there's, there's going to be a lot of guys that if they have to put more than one trap on a buoy are just going to be right out of business. Like I, that picture of the guy in the skiff in your slideshow, that's me. I mean, I just built my business up. I got the hell out of that death trap. I got a 33 footer now. My business is totally solely built to fish single traps. Well, that's a comment you want to make to us when we get to that part of the, of the hearing. Yeah. For a lot of people too. Okay. Well, Dan, this is the last comment. So if we right. want to transition to OS and he yeah. can go ahead, Gary, to provide his comment and the rest of the folks in the audience can raise their hands. We can go that way. Okay. Go ahead, Garrett. I mean, that's, that's really all I wanted to touch on was the, the 29 feet. Is Garrett, is there a vessel size that, um, that we should, we, that we could consider? It, it should, it shouldn't really matter. I mean, it, it should not matter one bit, whether you're hauling single traps out of a, a 23 footer out of a 43 footer, it shouldn't matter. I mean, no questions asked. The smaller the boat, the more dangerous it is. Mm -hmm. I, I went swimming this summer myself. It's not fun. I mean, 29 feet, I'm speaking for like everybody out of Nosset Inlet right now. And that's unacceptable. Like half the Outer Cape Lobster men or more I'm speaking for. Mm -hmm. And is there a feature to the outer Cape fishery that that is different than what's over on the other side of the Cape and the Bay? Is there, is there something about? Yeah, the, the our Cape? bottom. Yeah, we got a lot of good bottom, and we get all, we get very congested, and you we we can't jam. I mean, there's some guys that fish trawls, and it's like everybody trawls up, and you put one guy, a little guy, in there with some singles the one little guy he's going to get put out of business because he's going to get put butchered i mean any any time the singles intermingle with the trawls you get caught up it's just how it is and i mean it just it doesn't make sense to dictate how somebody has to fish their gear or how they set their gear out of the size vessel that they're they're in Okay. I'm speaking from two generations now. My father Lenny, I grew I grew up fishing outer Cape. My brother Jeremy. I mean, trawls weren't even a thing until Richie Richie Chase started fishing them. And there's only like two guys in the outer Cape, Richie and Glenn Svenningson, that even Glenn fishes some singles. I mean, that's it. Everybody else is single traps. It's a, it's a very big deal for us. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd ask you to also, uh, you know, put it in writing as well. Uh, in, I will. In some, in, that'd be helpful. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Garrett. Kaylee? Hi, uh, can you hear me? I can, Kaylee. 
Hi. Um, so first, I just want to take a second to state my respect for and admiration of our New England fishermen and lobstermen, um, as these are some of the most hardworking people in the seafood industry. Um, what I'm hoping to see in future regulations is to implement a pathway for ropeless fishing in the state. Um, I want to stress that the implementation of ropeless fishing gear regulations does not have to come at a huge cost to these fishermen, and that creating a funding program for the gear would help relieve a huge burden. In many ways, using fishing gear may even be able to replace fishing zone closures in the efforts to protect the right whale. And with the widespread use of ropeless gear, fishermen wouldn't have to worry about losing days or even weeks worth of their income to zone closures. And the North Atlantic right whale population would be allowed a chance to prosper without the threat of deadly entanglements. Thank you, Kayla. Madison, Madison Lynch, you can unmute yourself. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, so my name is Maddie. I'm a student at Emerson College um, and I grew up in the coastal town of Dartmouth here in Mass. Um, but even though I grew up so close to the water, I had never heard of North Atlantic right whales until about a year and a half ago. Um, but I started re researching that in that short period of time. Um, I've really come to care about this issue. But unfortunately during that same time, which was only about a year, as I said, um, the population has declined to only 366 whales. And now I feel like every time I look at the news, the um, majority of the stories describe yet another right whale, right whale tragedy. Entanglements are the leading cause of right whale deaths and also limit the whale's ability to reproduce. For the whales that are able to reproduce, their caps are essentially set up for failure. For a species on the brink of extinction, this is unacceptable. Right now, we've seen two new right whale calves, and so I hope that we can give these calves a chance of survival. I've also heard about ropeless fishing gear and its effectiveness in preventing whales from getting trapped in buoy lines. When speaking to friends and family about ropeless gear, which has been studied by NOAA for over 20 years, their first question is always the same. If entanglements are so lethal, why aren't we using ropeless fishing gear? I can honestly not provide them with a valid answer because ropeless gear should be included. And if we're really going to give these whales a, a fair shot at survival, ropeless gear needs to be considered. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madison. Marco Flag. Marco, you're up. All right, well, thank you very much. I'm Marco Flag. Uh, some of you may know me. I'm the CEO of Desert Star Systems. So we are a ropeless equipment manufacturer. And my comment was, is that I understand, you know, you made it clear that the reason that ropeless isn't on the agenda yet is because of the perceived difficulty of letting other fishers know where your gear is, so gear overlay. I would recommend uh, for one part looking at the uh, test report of the Cold Water Lobster Association up there in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, where they did a competitive, a competitive fishing trial with several fishing boats uh, laying multiple trawls, um, quarter mile between trawls typically, over a period of three days. <clears throat> I don't have the exact number on top of my head, but I think it was something on the order of 36, um, uh, you know, trawl deployments and recoveries and not a single overlay. And it is coordinated through um, <clears throat> a virtual gear marking app, and there are several of those around now kind of like GPS gear marking. Um, it's worthwhile pointing out that uh, Fishers commented, one in particular that I was on the boat with, but also the group overall, at the sense that if everybody was fishing that way, they would prefer it. That is virtual gear marking over buoy spotting, mm -hmm. simply because you can have a view of the whole gear field and in particular in inclement weather, and it was pretty rough those uh, weeks in uh, that week in um, uh, uh, October or so, um, you know, you just can see your marks, your virtual marks more reliable than a buoy that you might miss out there. So um, that has been the experience with it. Of course, uh, we 
in our everyday life, realize it or not, we are using virtual gear marking all the time when you're looking at your, your car GPS and you're going like, oh, there's an accident ahead. That's a virtual gear mark. We do use those things. And I think the value to fishers to having this option available is very substantial. And my sense is from having observed this over a number of years that that fishers in uh, a local area, say fishing out of a port, will pretty soon come to standardize on whatever sort of method of, of virtual gear marking they use so they know where each other's gear is uh, located. Yeah, no. sir, sir, if I could, if I could just interrupt, um, because we can't, uh, because we're not uh, proposing specific rules on that, I think your comments are probably best for for uh, another session when we can talk about this in detail. So if you have specific comments on our proposals, uh, I think we'd really like to hear from you or if you're done, we can we can take that up with some of us uh, in more of a private setting or, or in another forum. Yeah, that was really my comment. So overall, I would really encourage you to give fishers that option of ropeless fishing and thereby fishing in these closed uh, zones, you know, make it a vertical okay. rope closure, not a, a trough. Yeah, so, so you're uh, suggesting that if we close the, the, the rest of those waters to allow ropeless to uh, to take place in there. That's exactly. Your point. That's your point. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Margo. All right, I'm seeing one more comment from Garrett. Before we go back to Garrett, I was wondering if anyone else had a comment. Otherwise, we'll go back. All right, Steve, you're up. So I, I'd like to point out a fact here that I keep hearing all this talk about, about ropeless fishing and ropeless fishing. And, and from day one, when this was brought up, we were told that it's, it's been a huge success in Australia. Well, it's 2020 and through social media, you can reach anybody you want in the world. So I took it upon myself to reach out to the commercial f fishing fleet in Australia. Now I was getting up in the middle of the night to talk to these guys because they're on the other side of the world. And I asked them how it worked and if it worked, they told me flat out that it does not work. They had more lost gear, more Marine debris and more issues, more money spent trying to fish ropeless gear. Now, Every trawl that I fish costs me $3,000. And when we lose it to draggers, to anything else, we do, we do everything in our power. We make every effort to get this gear back. This guy's talking about fishing, setting gear a quarter of a mile apart. The fact of the matter is, is that when we're all piled up on an edge, or we're all piled up someplace because that's where the body of lobsters are. Sometimes we're fishing within a hundred feet of each other. Yeah. And, and it's it is not feasible when you put all these variables like tide, wind, you know, wave action, the tide can be going north and south on the surface, but it could be going east and west on the bottom. It's, it's completely unreasonable. And then we get into the whole mobile gear problem, which you know, Jared can attest to that because you guys are dealing with the state water draggers and the state water lobster boats. And when they can see the gear, it's nothing but an issue. Yeah. Hey, how much, Steve, Steve, how listen, much marine debris are we going to, are yeah, we going to. Those are really good questions. And, and I, for the, for the folks who are still listening in, uh, we have received a, um, a substantial grant. Um, I guess it's around $200,000. Uh, we're hiring a, a consultant to look at these questions and there's going to be, uh, you know, scores of interviews and Steve Boudreau, I will make sure that you are among those who will be interviewed as, as, uh, as the other gentleman who's involved with the, with the equipment. So I would prefer not to, I mean, it, it's, it's juicy conversation and it's fascinating to me, but for the purposes of this hearing, I think we should just focus on these proposals, but there will be other opportunities, I, I promise you, to you, um, to have your voices heard and to really um, uh, examine what the, what, the, uh, what the realities are of this gear and, and what it would take to make it work. So if you don't mind, um, I, I just wanna cut off that, what appears to be a debate 
Um, but I promise you that uh, DMF is going to be working to sort of uh, bring, ex expose these issues and try to resolve these issues. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Kim Sawicki, you're up. Kim, you can Hi, sorry, can you hear me? I can, Kim. Hi, sorry. Uh, so I just had, I know that we're in question, uh, questions, comments area. We've, I've heard a lot of both tonight. Um, I have a few questions. I just wanted to know if, if you have an idea of what percentage of fishers and mass are gonna be affected by your proposed changes. So like recreational versus commercial. Do you, do you know this yet? I, I, well, um, we have about 800 active lobstermen fishing in state waters, and we have about a few thousand um, recreational potters. Is that the, your question? Yeah, I want. I, I I really wanted to know <clears throat> what percentage of those 800 active commercial fishers versus the few thousand recreational fishers would be affected by the, the proposed rule changes. Yeah. I just wanna know how that those changes will be applied to both sectors. Do you, do you have those figures or is that uh, we something don't, we you don't, could provide? We don't have them okay. handy, but I'll make sure that in our final recommendation, we do uh, okay. try to uh, develop that. Um, but again, uh, the federal permit holders who, are, who have the opportunity to move into the EEZ wouldn't be affected by this state waters closure. Um, so it's, it's and sure. not yeah, every no, fisherman that... already fishes during that time period of February through April, since the weather's lousy, uh, catches tend to be low and uh, gear losses tend to be high because of storms. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and so, uh, I, I'm just wondering, do we, do we know with these changes, um, is there, and I, I know David Abel touched on it a little bit, some other people did as well. Is there any type of economic uh, like assessment that's been done on how this will affect mass fishers, uh, like commercially? I, I definitely wreck fishers are important as well, but I'm just wondering about the guys that have families to feed. Is this going to affect a, a large number of them? Um, Obviously, some of them have already come up with fishing adjuncts, such as the South Shore Sleeve and other uh, ways to sort of be able to keep fishing when there are whales present. So what, what are your ideas about that? Well, the, um, when the whales are present in Cape Cod Bay, uh, there is no fish, there's no fixed gear fishing that's allowed um, at all, even, even with the sleeve. Uh, the gear is prohibited. So um, the what the fate of, of those fishermen um, unable to fish in, in Cape Cod Bay during those three months uh, is going to be uh, extended to the rest of state waters. Uh, our, our data show that most of the, there's very little fishing that goes on in February, um, a little bit in, in March and in April, it does, it, it historically it does tend to, to ramp up. Um, we certainly will have that when we go to our commission, uh, you know, with a final recommendation, we'll have some estimate of, 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 of the likely impacts. Okay, thanks. Um, that mostly <clears throat> was really just sort of, it, my, my concerns are, you know, we've, we've been dealing with an ocean that is, it is not static, right? So things are changing all the time. I just want to make sure we're not getting ourselves into a situation that might change in the future. And then we've got people locked into something. Um, and, and with that being said, uh, what is there like a next step? If this, you know, the plan that's proposed you know, say the 1700 pound breaking strength rope and the closures and the South Shore sleeves don't work. And God forbid we have an ITP in place and we get a whale that shows up with mass gear on it someplace, a right whale. Like what, what happens then? That's, 
that's a big concern for me because mass fishermen have already done so much to try to mitigate any risk to these animals. Like if this is our Hail Mary, what happens next? What's the next step? That's a good question. I mean, this is a, a, a national plan. Um, the take reduction plan is, is, um, is promulgated by all the states and the federal government. And um, we'll see. I mean, we've had two entanglements in 11 years, one in 10 years. And, uh, you know, it is something that, that we all are concerned about on a regular basis. And, and I know all the lobstermen are as well. So um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a stock answer of, of what happens if we have an entanglement of Massachusetts gear with, with a right whale. We're, we're certainly working to prevent that. No, for sure. And I, I think you've all done amazing work toward that goal. I'm just worried about what happens if, if we can't prevent that going forward. Is there, you know, it would be great to know that we have sort of a backup plan. And I think it's been talked about a bit tonight, but we've got a lot of fishermen that have even spoken towards other options. Um, so hopefully, and I know that Mass has set aside funding for alternative gear exploration. So hopefully we can keep moving forward with that. Thanks, Kim. Jared, next. CLA. Hi, do you hear me? I can, yes. Hi, yes. Uh, so my question comment um, is with regards to the state water closures. And my question is, I know that you, a few people have um, asked about the economic impacts and um, of this closure. And you did mention that some, you know, there's uh, less fishing during the months of February through April. However, I wanted to know if there's been consideration given to the fact that, you know, fishermen have up to 800 traps, you know, out in the water um, during the year to fish. And due to the weather, especially during this time of year, it can take months even to get that all out of the water. So that's taking off two other months of like fishing um, time and uh, of making money as well. And the same thing goes the other way, which, you know, a lot of fishermen start take putting their gear out in March and April and that won't be possible. So they'll start fishing later as well. And I just wanted to make sure this is being considered. Yeah, it, it, we are aware of that. And, and it, that is one of the painful aspects of, of not only this proposal, but the rules that we enacted um, five and six years ago when we closed Cape Cod Bay, um, because we know it did affect fishermen's ability and also created a bottleneck at the pier when everybody wanted to you know, set the gear at the on the opening day. So we, we certainly understand um, those challenges as well. Um, you know, the uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, but uh, we are aware of that. Okay. Brad, you're recognized. You can unmute yourself. Yes, I have a quick question. Um, so right now we mock our end lines with the, you know, the red tape or whatever you want to use as red. So are these new, um, these new breakaway points, are they going to be color coded red or what's going on with that? I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So one of the things, the state of Massachusetts is probably going to be going to Yeah, he's dropped out again. Yeah, I didn't. So are we, are we, I mean, are we getting rid of all the red, you know, totally, or what's going on with that? I mean, some fishermen may choose to fish rope that is entirely 1,700 pounds. They would have to intertwine their orange marks throughout there. Uh, or if you have used the sleeves, the orange sleeve would suffice as that marking as well if it was colored. All right, so we're, get, we're going to be getting rid of red altogether then. Correct. Yeah, okay. 
All right, that's all. Thank you. Bob, are we also getting rid of the, the breakaway below the buoy? I think we are, right? We are not. Okay. That is not proposed in the federal regs. Okay, thanks. So then, so then do you actually have on that comment to the the break the breakaway on the buoy? So I that'd be seventeen hundred plus another six, right? That's twenty three hundred pounds. No, it's it's it has to have the buoy, you know, the breakaway buoy swivel or the dog bone or whatever you use or uh, for the for this that attaches the buoy is different than the seventeen hundred pound line or contrivance in the buoy line itself. Um, that's in addition to that. It's not additive. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. There's a couple more, Dan. Just bear with me as I go through it. Sure. Megan O. Megan, you there? Megan, I'm going to come back to you. Eric, you're up. Uh, I, if I heard correctly, Bob was cutting in, but we're switching from red to orange. And I believe I heard the other day that the Canadian crab fishery is orange. So I guess my comment is like, why are we losing the red to go to orange when there's a, a serious entanglement risk to people that already have orange markings on their line? Hey, uh, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So a couple things. Uh, first is we, we took orange based on what was initially suggested by Mass Lobsterman's Association. Um, we, that color isn't finalized, we can go to another color. And as Beth Cassoni mentioned earlier, she did bring that up and um, it, I'm not that concerned about it because the Canadian snow crab gear is consist of really large diameter line and in mass we're gonna be con con constrained to using only three eighths line. But again, we, you know, if another color makes more sense, um, we can, we can, certainly add that in that's not uh the color is not completely chosen yet at this point i'm really fond of red i like the red yeah the problem with the red is that that's been used for all lobster gear and what you don't want to have is is a situation whereby anything that comes up with a piece of red on it is automatically attributable to massachusetts you can remember there's over a million buoy lines that were fished last year that all have a red mark or, or so uh, based on, you know, Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, all have to have red on their lobster. So I'm a little worried about taking on red. I think the risk of us getting misidentified with red is higher than orange and Canadian snow crab gear. That's true. But now I'm going to have to take all the reds off. Yeah, and I, I just want to clarify for, for those in attendance that this gear marking discussion about the colors is not part of this proposal. It's part of a uh, federal rule that has yet to be published and we will have to come back out to public hearing to adopt whatever comes out of that. Okay, I'm done. I think I'm done with the comments on the colors. I'm good. Thank you, Eric. All right. Chuck Gilchrist. Hi, um, I'm the Nova Braid guy again. Um, I just wanted to mention that it was it was brought up that the sleeves that we're currently making are orange in color, but they also have red flecks on them. So uh, I don't know how that would equate to what you guys may or may not be uh, looking to achieve with regards to gear marking, but that is certainly something. I will um, say that uh, and, and it is something to take, uh, take into consideration. The amount of different colors that are available in the yarns that the sleeves are made of are not infinite. So we would ask that if you're going to be proposing color markings, which I know are not part of this whole arrangement, that you consult with the manufacturers before you start saying, well, we need purple and turquoise and puced and, and mauve and everything else such as that, because you have to consider what the, um, what the suppliers are actually gonna be able to produce. 
but that's all I have to say. Thank you, Chuck. Rob Martin. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? I can, Rob. Yeah, just a quick question. Solid orange for southern near shore trap all waters, mid-Atlantic areas four, five, and six. So just be aware of that. And in the south shore sleeve, which it's already orange, the oldest sleeves have a red and white tracer in them already. That's all I had to say. Thank you, Rob. Garrett, we're back to you. Just a quick thing on the on like ropeless. Those two girls in the beginning made me want to say this. So the whole state goes ropeless. Yeah, Garrett, we're we're really not going to propose that tonight. Um, I, we took the comment from someone who said if you're going to close the areas, allow ropeless. But I don't want to get into a, a debate. But I will be happy to put you on the list of people who are going to be interviewed on what challenges ropeless brings. I promise you that okay. you, your, your voice will be heard through that grant where we're, we're going to conduct all those interviews. One, one more, one more thing. How long have we been marking our gear now for with the, the yellow for our, for a single trap, like six years, right? About that. Yeah. Has any single trap ever been pulled off a whale? Off of humpback whales. Yeah, but not right whales, though. I'm pretty sure off that humpback it was a trawl, though. But you know what? Um, we will get, if you want, we'll look into that and get back to you. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right, Dan, I have one last comment coming from Kim Sawicki. Yeah, let's make this the last comment. And what we can do is uh, well, there'll be another hearing tomorrow night. But, but go um, ahead, Kim. Go ahead, Jared, would you say? Uh, be before that, Megan, oh, who had her hand raised earlier, has raised her hand again. So we can recognize her after Kim and then call the hearing. Sounds good. Thanks. Go ahead, Kim. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, one thing in relation to ropeless, I do think that <clears throat> as a comment, I do think it should be coming up at some point in the plan for mass because there are fishers that, that really do want it. They've been working really hard for it. They need it. We've got other fisheries in the U S that are actively pursuing it as an opportunity. And I do think it's something that should be subsidized uh, for those fishers that can't fish because of closures. I'm not speaking specifically even to this particular proposed rule as it, it is in existence, but the fact that it could set a standard for the rest of Massachusetts, I think that there is a place for it in certain areas, not all, um, but I do think that fishers like Garrett and others, Mike, Rob, there, there have been a, a number of them that have spoken this evening. They have had very pertinent questions that researchers like myself would really like to answer. Um, and I think that any opportunity for these groups to get together to work on this to, as an alternative measure to, to allow guys to um, should, should be encouraged and, and become a part of these rules or proposed rules. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Megan O. Megan? Sorry, Megan, I'm not, your audio does not seem to be working this evening. Uh, you can submit a comment in writing or uh, try to attend again tomorrow. Dan, back to you to end. Okay, so um, thank you, everyone. Um, we had some pretty amazing attendance tonight. Um, over two, up to 200 people were listening into this call um, uh, at its peak. Um, so I really appreciate uh, a lot of the comments and a lot of the engagement that we had tonight. There will be another hearing tomorrow night. Um, hopefully I can stay on script and uh, present the information exactly the same way. 
Um, but um, uh, the the, the uh, record will remain open uh, through uh, a week from Friday. Um, it is always best to um, put your thoughts in writing. Um, otherwise, uh, one of us is going to have to uh, interpret or or or, um, or uh, you know capture your thoughts and, and uh, other descriptions of, of the comment. It's always best to come directly from, from you all. So um, thanks for attending tonight. Um, thanks for, uh, for the support. And uh, I know this is a difficult issue for all of us. Uh, we all wanna save the right whale. And, um, and I, I really appreciate everybody's efforts tonight uh, in this important hearing. So having said that, um, this uh, hearing is adjourned uh, and uh, it'll be posted on our YouTube channel by tomorrow morning. So thanks a lot.